a shout out to G Holla and S. Hey, G Holla, G dot Holla. Hero, G E Holla. Shout out to me to God here, man. Well, y'all said in the Taylor, shout out my God, G Holla. <laughs> Rocking right out with oh, G Holla. Thank you so much. Shout out to G Holla, reaching 1 million listeners on his podcast. Oh, it's Chuck Rock. Tell me, what is it like being in the industry for the last 50 years? Tell me something. It's beautiful. Um, I haven't been in it 50. Um, the genre being around 50. The genre, yes. Um, I don't know, my time is about 38. Um, 87? 86. Oh, 86. Okay, 86. Yeah, 86 okay. For me. But, um, beautiful. It allowed me to see the world and meet great people and, and do things in our community. And beautiful. Hip hop is incredible. So we think. So when we think of Chubb Rock, we think of an innovator, one of the originators, introducing us into this hip-hop world. Tell me, what is it like seeing or comparing hip-hop to when you came in and when you were doing it back in the 80s and 90s and now to the new artist that's coming in? How is that in comparison? Well, when we were young, you know, we were all, again, just young people um, during a time when no one really knew what this thing was. Um, there was no business structure for it. Labels knew they liked it, but didn't know who was going to really make money. You know, so it's all, everything, all the firsts happened. Oh, wow, your first video and how you did that and your first kind of promotional tour. How did that happen? And your first this and your first that. There's a lot of firsts when we were doing it. Um, and we just learn from other acts, other acts learn from us. We all were there for each other to go through some of those pitfalls, and those twists and turns. Um, talking about it on tour buses, yo, what happened to you when you did this? And what happened with you when you did that? And, you know, and we kind of learned that way. So now it's different. I mean, it's an established genre. Okay. We know it's a billion dollar industry. Oh yeah, most definitely. So the young people have a little bit more of an advantage, but they have a new algorithm to deal with, streaming, mm -hmm. no real buying CDs and things of that nature, which is a little more tangible yeah. than the streaming paradigm, because we don't even know how you're really calculating that much. Right, so if we go by history, and history's always been put together to rob black artists, mm, that's they're probably true. getting robbed too. But they're a little more forward thinking on an independent level. So that's why the younger generation, they, 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 they got it together. Okay, okay. You know, so um, definitely happy about that. And, um, but it's hip hop and it's gonna last forever. As long as there's young people, it's gonna be hip hop. So you've had this incredible career. It's been so lasting, like you say, from 86 until now. Yeah. And you have your own radio station. So how did that come about? That started around 2000. Um, a, a lady by the name of uh, Lisa G that used to be on the radio with Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. Oh, okay. Um, when one of the radio stations in New York was looking for someone, she recommended me. Oh. She didn't even know if I wanted to do radio, but she thought my voice was great for it, and she just thought she just saw something that I didn't see yet. Okay. So it started there, and then it just built from me. Okay. So the kindness of others, like everything else. And that's how it started. So what has that journey been like? Because your voice is being heard by millions of people. So you have this ability to touch people, not just through music, but through your sound, as she was saying. How has that journey been? Positive. Um, very positive to me. Um, people love what we do. We've been proud of the music we did. We didn't do anything negative uh, yeah. towards women or men, each other, or whatever. So, um, you know, kids can listen to us. If That's right. Their mom is driving around in the car, picking them up from school. Mm -hmm. They can listen to those songs and not have to be like, oh, I got to turn this part down. <laughs> so I think we've been... Um, I think we've been lucky. Okay. And and I agree, you know, being able to listen to your music and have it to transcend through times and through different generations, you know, it's, it gives the next generation hope to say, okay, we know what quality is. We know what to listen to. We know what we can produce. So with that, what do you feel is next? For hip-hop? Towards hip-hop, yeah. 
mean, we, we've done everything. We've been in television. We've been in movies. We're obviously brand ambassadors for a million products. Um, I just find it to be more. Um, I still believe that we got to come up with a different thing than streaming. Okay. I don't think the I don't think the future is streaming. Okay. I think I think most music artists at some point are going to disconnect from streaming because they don't understand the business model of it. Okay. You know, like okay, a billion streams to make. No. You know that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So. I think that's going to go away. And so some smart young person, it could be this young <laughs> thing here who hasn't gotten to that age yet, will come up with whatever is the new way to get music to people mm -hmm. that will allow them to buy the music, artists to make money from the music, and not all this streaming kind of make believe stuff. Okay, okay. So take a little turn with me, because I, I was looking at some things, and I was like, okay, I didn't know that you came from Kingston, Jamaica. And I was like, okay, so that's dope. So what was that transition like from going from Kingston, to Jamaica to here? It was a real transition because my whole generation is from Jamaica. So okay. when you're in New York, in a Caribbean neighborhood, okay, everybody there is Caribbean. So you don't really go outside of that culture. Like my father, I've never seen my father eat a burger, eat Chinese food, eat pizza. He never took his money out of the Caribbean community, mm -hmm. right? So we we didn't really get outside of that Carib that community. Okay. So there was no real transition to make. I mean, my friends are Caribbean. We went to school with Caribbean people, and okay. you know, and we ate Caribbean food and that kind of thing. My my father would get his clothes made by a Haitian man, Mr. <laughs> Pierre, on Flatbush, and his hats was done. By, I mean, everything was in the Caribbean space. So it's all about the culture. Without question. So with that, we see sometimes that, and, and you mentioned how we kept our money within the neighborhood, within the community. How is that now when you see so many different things and that sometimes it seems like we kind of get a little separated from the culture, that we get a little separated from our communities and we take our monies elsewhere, opposed to building our communities up because we see where some of our communities that once was thriving is no longer thriving. So what do you feel are things that we could do to perhaps bring that back? It's hard. It's hard now because a lot of those mom and pop stores when I was growing up that my father dealt with are gone now mm. because all the big stores came. Yeah. And, and it takes a dedication, you know. It was time for graduations of middle school. My father would take me to his friend in from Jamaica. He would measure me and, say, and then they'll make my suit. But, you know, all of those things are gone now. Because people would go on Amazon and buy a suit for their kids and this and that and that's mm -hmm. the end of it. So it's hard, but it could start with one dedication. Okay. Right? So if you if you decide that if you're gonna eat food outside of home, eat at a black owned restaurant. Yeah. Just try that one dedication. Okay. Right? That will still move mountains. Right? Because we know you're gonna wake up, you're gonna go get gas, that goes that money goes somewhere else. You're gonna get on a subway or a bus to get to work, that goes to someone else. You're gonna buy a car, that goes to someone else. So try to pick one thing out of that time out in the street that you can give back to us. And that can mainly easily be food. Hey, I know baby girl over here makes this, I'm gonna go there. Oh, okay. I feel for a piece of cake. Oh, baby girl over here has a cake shop and a, I'm gonna go here. And if you do, that, that one dedication will move mountains. Okay. It ain't gonna be as like my father when we were young, because he was dead set against it. Like he would <laughs> never give his money outside of his coat, ever. Wow. You know? Wow. That's incredible. So, taking it back to music and when you were growing up, what type of music were you listening to? Only Caribbean. Reggae music, dancehall music, that's it, you know. My mother would listen to Dinah Ross and some soul music and stuff, Marvin Gaye, but very little. Everything was Caribbean. 
<laughs> so was the Caribbean music what inspired the rap or how did all that come about? Because that's like something, when you think of rap, you, you hear the hip hop and all of that and Caribbean music, it makes you want to dance, it gives you the mood. So at what point do you say, okay, I like this, I kind of like this style, or were you freestyling in the streets, or how did that come about? I mean, everything starts with a drum beat. So hip hop is, is all about a drum beat. So it's very easy to make that transition, you know? And then Caribbean people have a certain inflection that's different than most. So if you think about the paradigm of all these artists, but think about who's from the Caribbean. Yeah.